these systems can do one thing, they can do it's this very narrow thing very, very well, but they can't do a broad array of tasks where they can sort of fluidly use their knowledge between tasks as opposed to just focusing on one task. So that's really the difference between us, we humans, and our intelligence and current machine intelligence. Google Translate uh, can translate sentences from one language to another that become so good, and yet to say, but they're not as smart as human beings. They don't understand what they're doing. These systems, they're not understanding. So why is that? Why they're so good, but they're not as smart as human beings? Well, they're good in one sense in that they can deal with the kinds of data that they've been trained on. You know, they, they, so Google Translate has been trained on millions and millions of uh, documents in, in pairs of languages. So it can do a really good job most of the time. But if you've ever tried to translate something that's more colloquial or that has slang or that has maybe a kind of a four of some kind, Google Translate can make errors that no human would ever make. And the errors that it makes shows that it really doesn't understand what it's translating. It's using statistical correlations, but it's not, doesn't have a deep underlying understanding of things that it's talking about. Sometimes I, I, I think of AI today a little bit and I don't know if it is politically correct to say, but a little bit like, you know, the down uh, this is. It's like being able to do one thing very well, but then lacking at making the connections with the reality. We humans are, we have all this knowledge about the world. And that comes into play every time we use language. So one example was uh, that I talked about in my book was translating a, a little story w about a restaurant, somebody in a restaurant, and they were unhappy. And the question is, they walked out without paying the bill. In one case, it translated bill, the legislative document, <laughs> like, like a legislative bill, because it didn't really understand the story. It didn't understand that if you're in a restaurant, word bill is not going to refer to a legislative document. It's going to refer to, you know, the, the thing that you need to pay. And this is something that we humans, you know, when we're, we're interacting with the world and we're speaking and understanding language, we have these sort of internal models of the way the world works that we've learned at a very early age. And that makes us make sense of what's going on in a way that these computer systems can't do, at least not right now. The example is very on spot to understand, uh, you know, the difference between artificial intelligence and human intelligence. But if you think of this, there have been even large companies like think of IBM, they've invested massively in artificial intelligence. And one of their projects, IBM Watson, a few years ago, no, they, they wanted to be able to analyze all the papers in medicine and basically creating uh, this ability to understand all these papers. Uh, they said that uh, Watson can read 22 million uh, scientific publications from medicine in, in a week. But then they did add challenges to uh, really make sense of that reading. What do you make of that? Like, um, like the case of this IBM Watson project for cancer was an example in the industry of something that was, you know, expected to give so many results, but it didn't get to where it was supposed to go. Right. So when we use the word read, you know, when, when, when you and I read something, again, we're using our background knowledge of the world to understand it. When a program like Watson reads it, quote unquote reads it, um, it's processing the language in some way, but it's just doing it in a very different way than we humans do because it doesn't have that kind of background knowledge or the ability to apply what it's learned in one domain into another domain that's not the same that, that it's learned. So it's not doing the same kind of reading that we do. The word just is probably not appropriate using the word read for a, a program like Watson. In AI and machine learning, people talk about this notion of brittleness. Brittleness means that a, a program 
is trained in one area and does very, very well in that area, but it's unable to apply its knowledge in another area. It will make mistakes that no human would ever make. And Watson, like all other AI programs today, has this problem of brittleness because it doesn't have the ability to sort of use its knowledge in a flexible way the way we humans do. Um, so that's really the frontier of AI is to get over this brittleness problem where, as you said, these systems can do one thing, they can do it's this very narrow thing very, very well, but they can't do a broad array of tasks where they can sort of fluidly use their knowledge between tasks as opposed to just focusing on one task. So that's really the difference between us, we humans, and our intelligence and current machine intelligence. For many years, the researcher, I think, uh, they've been trying to follow model of intelligence of the human mind. And when we allude to, you know, reading or speech recognition, we usually uh, utilize this model that is called supervised intelligence. So basically, is before you teach, and then after the algorithm is able to carry a task on its own. But there are other models of intelligence like unsupervised, so it's kind of you find out something on your own, or reinforcement learning, which is basically like the kid that put the finger in the flame, he gets art and will never put it again. Um, is the problem at that level in your opinion? So it's the type of uh, mimicking of intelligence, or it's even deeper than that? It's I mean, could we solve the problem with um, unsupervised learning or with reinforcement learning, or there is even more than that? That's a really good question. I don't think anyone knows the answer. I personally feel that there's something there. But let me just first say that, you know, supervised learning means, usually it means that a human has labeled each example. Like if I'm trying to teach the machine, the difference between dogs and cats and images. I take a bunch of pictures of dogs and I label them as dog. And then I take a bunch of pictures of cats and label them as cat. And then the machine learns from associating those, the pictures with the labels. So a human has labeled every single thing. Well, that's clearly not the way that children learn. We don't label everything in the world and show millions of examples. Uh, children, in this much more, as you said, unsupervised way, where they interact with the world, they seek out knowledge, they learn in a much more active way. There's this new approach to learning that's getting a lot of kind of attention right now in, in machine learning called self-supervised learning, which is when a machine, a human doesn't label anything, but the machine learns from being given some part of the data and then predicting another part of the data. One of the most examples of this is when I give the machine like part of a sentence and it tries to predict the rest of the sentence. Like I say, I was driving too fast and I got stopped by the blank. And the machine's uh, goal is to predict something like police, right? That what word comes in the blank. And if you do this with huge amounts of data, millions and millions of sentences, you can get machines that can actually do very well on a lot of language-related tasks. That's called supervised learning. Whether it's going to produce more intelligent systems in the long run, I don't know. I still think that there's something missing, which is this kind of basic knowledge about the world that all have that you call common sense that is not going to be learned from any of these techniques.